Uh, hi, my name is uh, Praveer Chandra, and I'm uh, going to talk a little bit today about the uh, OpenSAM project. Um, for, if you guys had looked at the actual program online uh, a few weeks back, it was actually originally this spot was a BSIM talk, but uh, the speaker wasn't available, so now you get an OpenSAM guy instead. Um, so uh, I've actually given this talk a number of times in a number of different venues, just talking about uh, the SAM project, and I've done it kind of as an intro talk. Um, but uh, really, you know, my, my background and what I do professionally is consulting. So uh, I've actually been working with a number of different customers on programs, on real programs that they've rolled out over the course of the past eight months, nine months or so. Um, and so I wanted to actually put together some lessons learned and actually talk to, you know, talk to real programs a little bit. So um, what I'm going to try to cover is a little bit about um, some of those lessons learned, right? And I did them kind of a, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but uh, we'll, we'll hopefully uh, learn a little bit out of that and hopefully take some gems away from it. Um, and then I'll actually, after that, talk a little bit about the model itself and some of the, the workings of it. Just by a show of hands real quick, how many people have actually looked at the OpenSAM project before? Okay, cool, quite a few. Actually, that's a lot more than I expected. Excellent. Um, and uh, let's see, and then at the very end of the talk, I'll actually talk a little bit about sort of the, the project structure itself and then where we're going to uh, go with it, I think. So, uh, and also, by the way, if there are questions at any point, just feel free to raise your hand or throw them out, uh, and we'll, we'll try to answer them in line. I'm, I'm going to try to save a little bit of time at the end for questions as well, but uh, if you have a question that's uh, immediately relevant, certainly feel free to interrupt. Um, okay, so some sort of, uh, let's, let's start with the first lesson, I think, for, uh, uh, that we've learned is that, you know, when you talk to an organization, what does it mean to do insert, you know, insert security activity here for security? Uh, when someone says, we do pen testing, uh, or we do code review, or we do threat modeling, um, does that mean you do it for everything? Probably not. Uh, most organizations, at least when it comes to real programs, they actually have to be pretty, uh, pretty rigorous about picking and choosing which activities they're actually going to do for, for different applications, uh, which implies a few things, right? It implies that you actually have to have some sort of reasonable decision criteria. Uh, and that's actually something that's a little bit outside of the the same model itself, but something that we've noticed in, in the real world, right? So you, uh, as, a, as an organization, if I have, you know, 200 applications and, uh, well, first of all, the, the step zero is I have to count how many applications I have, right? I have to know what software I have. And believe it or not, uh, there's plenty of organizations out there that really have no clue, right? Uh, you know, when it comes to actually having application inventory. So that's a step zero that we really didn't uh, talk about explicitly in the SAM model, but it's important nonetheless, right? The other thing that we talk about a little bit in the SAM model around the strategy and metrics area uh, is this notion of actually having risk rankings, right? So you have to tier your applications uh, according to some kind of criteria, right? And that criteria can vary from organization to organization, which is okay. Uh, but the, the point is, is that you have to have some criteria for tiering it, right? Uh, so you could say, okay, of my 200 applications, these 50 are the highest risk, and then this next set of 100 are the medium risk, and this next, you know, the last 50 are, are low risk. Uh, and, and high, medium, low is just about as sophisticated as I've seen it get, right? Uh, I've, I've worked with organizations that have actually done uh, some interesting things around these very complicated scoring algorithms for, uh, for how they're actually going to come up with what the risk rating is for an application. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really end up being any more complicated than just high, medium, low, right? You just have all these complicated scores that then just result in a high, medium, low. Um, and, and the reason that you do that is so that you can actually say accurately, we do pen testing for high risk applications and medium risk applications. Now that's a meaningful statement, right? Uh, you could say we do threat modeling for high risk applications and medium risk applications. We do code review for high risk applications only, or whatever the case may be, right? So that's, that's one, of the, um, one of the things that we've learned. Next, we're all snowflakes, right? which is that, uh, you know, you go to an organization and uh, most organizations, unless you're dealing with really, you know, relatively smaller or, or even some me medium-sized businesses, they have multiple development models that are in place, right? It's not like you can walk into a, to an organization that has a thousand developers and say, what development process do you use? And they're going to be like, that, that, that's a meaningless question. We use them all pretty much, like pick. Um, and and uh, depending on the level of, of control over a dev org, um, you can actually find that you have several different silos in even, even smaller uh, companies than that, right? So even if, if you have 100 developers, you might have two or three different process models in place. Um, and the idea behind, uh, behind uh, this lesson learned is that you really have to kind of tailor your SAM roadmap or whatever model you're using to build out your security program to that line of business or to that 
a specific type of, of development process that's in place, right? Um, because if you don't, then you sort of run the risk of not really uh, making uh, recommendations or making prescriptions for how security activities should be incorporated into a dev process, uh, you won't make them very specifically, and that's sort of the enemy of, of getting people to change, right? Like, unless you can tell them exactly what you sort of want them to do, uh, then it's going to be difficult, right? Does that make sense? Okay. So, uh, the next piece that, so that's the, this lesson learned is really about the fact that you have to kind of, at least as far as the model goes, or, or as far as any dev uh, or a secure SDLC model goes. You really have to pick your target in terms of a specific dev process and then write some enhancements in terms of security for that dev process. Okay, the next lesson learned is this whole idea of actually selling a program, right? Which is, uh, you know, when we look at the security space, we define victory as nothing happening, right? Which is sort of a terrible criteria or a terrible outcome uh, when you're trying to actually prove to someone that your program is worthwhile, right? So it's actually difficult uh, to, to really fully, um, well, to get someone uh, from a management perspective or from a business perspective to buy in. So you actually have to pay a little bit of attention to that and come up with real business statements for that organization in terms of what the impacts are, right? So if you actually have security risks, you have to make it real for that organization, right? You can't just say, well, you're gonna have a lot of SQL injection problems. Well, that doesn't mean anything. You have to talk to them in terms of what their business is and what actually uh, that impact would be, right? What, what kind of loss of functionality, what kind of loss of, uh, or, or potential damage to their customers are they gonna face and so forth. Uh, and, and I'm not saying this from, this from like a FUD standpoint, right? We're not just trying to, to throw, you know, uh, or to, to throw scare tactics at someone. What we're trying to do is actually make it real in terms of what is the risk that they're trying to manage to their business. So that's an important point. The next one is that uh, I, I will tell you first off that I'm, I'm a, a geek by, uh, by origin, I guess, right? So I, I mean, I started off working in, uh, uh, working in development and doing security research, and I still spend plenty of time writing code and doing all that uh, fun stuff. Uh, but when it comes to actually making an argument for a software security program, uh, it's not a technical argument, right? Uh, and you can't walk in saying, well, from a technical perspective, we need to incorporate all of these security activities. You can't walk in talking about, well, we have to start doing some dynamic testing and some static testing and, and start doing some threat modeling and all this stuff because those are really technical assessment activities, right? What you need to focus on, or at least as far as the conversation goes, is about a program that comprehensively reduces the risk that an organization faces from the software that they're producing, right? And your argument really has to be structured around that thesis rather than, you know, best practices say that we need to do all these technical assessments. I mean, that may be the case, and I completely agree with you, uh, but uh, in terms of making the argument and selling it up the, uh, up the chain, as it were, uh, it's important to have that, that focus in mind. Okay. The next lesson learned is that, uh, you know, in, in terms of controls, right, um, when you look at an organization, and, and once you say, you know, buy into this notion of let's build a software security program, um, you know, you could look at the SAM model and there's lots of activities and things like that, and, and there's the 12 practices that you can start looking at as to, you know, what activities you want to start incorporating. But remember before, just a second ago, I said it's all about a risk, a, a comprehensive program that reduces risk, right? So the idea is that you really have to be able to take whatever activities there are and map them to specific controls that that organization can then operate, right? Uh, and controls, at least in, in nature, kind of vary, right? So you can have things that are detective controls, like a pen test, which will help you detect when there's problems. Uh, or you can have things that are preventative controls, like a, a formalized process for specifying security requirements or something along those lines, right? And uh, preventative controls generally have a higher value in terms of how much risk they prevent in a real program than things like detective controls. And so you have to actually look at it as a, as a risk reduction formula and, and understand which kind of controls you're putting into place and formulate an argument around that, right? So your control structure has to actually have a defensible standpoint from a risk reduction standpoint. So, so that's the real, uh, the real idea behind it. Uh, and that sort of leads me into the, the next point, which is that actually getting a real return on investment for security is very, very possible. And you can actually make that argument very, uh, very nicely and very neatly for most organizations, right? And, and the way you structure that argument, at least at a high level, is around what I was just talking about with regard to controls. Uh, so when you, when you have an organization that's, say, concentrating on doing pen testing all the time and spending money on it, right, 
they're usually focused on, I mean, pen testing is in, in and of itself a detective control, right? So you can start saying, well, if we can start making preventative controls, then those typically have a higher value in terms of sort of an economic value to an organization, right? And so the general idea behind this is that, well, if we start taking some of these detective controls and instead of investing X dollars in that, invest some portion of that X into a preventative control, then we can either lower what that X value is, right, meaning spend less, or we could spend the same but have preventative controls and detective controls in place where the sum total of what you're spending is the same, but you have a higher economic value because inherently a preventative control is more valuable than a detective control. Is this making sense to folks, hopefully? The general idea is that uh, what you're trying to do is push things forward, and you're trying to make a business argument for why it's important to push things forward. Okay. The next lesson learned is this idea of, of uh, when we, at least from, a, from a, a theoretical standpoint, I'm sort of a model guy and a process guy, and I like to make sure that things look nice and, and neat and that they can actually be understandable and we have these good models for, uh, for doing um, security activities in a, in a life cycle. Uh, when it comes to actually putting rubber on the road with an organization, though, you really have to get specific about their processes, right? So you have to actually take whatever it is from a model standpoint. So you look at OpenSAM and you say, okay, I want to do the following activities or the following levels is, is my target. Uh, and, and what you have to do is actually take those activities and couch them in specific terms for what you expect people to do, meaning you have to get specific about the roles involved at your organization. You have to get specific about the individual responsibilities that you expect people to be, have, uh, to be, um, to be living up to, right, to be accountable for. Uh, and you also have to kind of map those things together into process flows that you expect those people to participate in, right? And those are pieces that, you know, we can't really, uh, well, we could maybe do a little bit more in terms of, you know, structuring some of that information and putting some of that information into the model so that you have something to bootstrap from. Uh, but at the end of the day, when it actually comes to a real program, you're always going to have to customize that piece. Even if we were able to come up with some generic process flows or things like that, or generic responsibilities, uh, at the end of the day, they have to actually be specific in the organization. Okay, uh, the next uh, piece is actually, you know, kind of following forward from there is this notion of, okay, now that we've gotten specific and we, we know what roles and responsibilities are in place, um, how do we actually get the manpower to operate these processes, right? This is a, this is a classic problem that uh, happens in almost every single organization that, um, that I've worked with that's rolling out a software security program. Um, and the idea is really, you have to be a bit, uh, a bit clever about uh, about how you go about getting those resources, because if you, um, if, well, uh, for those that are familiar with the BSIM study, if you look at it, they said about, you know, on average, there's about 1% of your developers that are actually, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, of your development population, about 1% should be people that are security team, right? So that means about one out of 100 people. So you go to an organization that has, you know, say 10,000 developers, and you say, okay, we got to hire 100 security guys. Uh, you're, you're going to get just laughed out of the office, right? I mean, you can't just hire 100 security guys, uh, even if you could find 100 security guys that you wanted to hire. Um, so really the idea of this is, is you have to work within the people that you already have at the organization. And so there's actually a SAM activity related to this, which is we call it security coaches in the SAM model. But the idea is to actually go through your organization, pick some of your star developers, pick some of your star architects, and put them through specific training for security. Uh, and make them your, your, uh, your arms and, and legs that are on the ground uh, it, when it comes to the dev population, right? So uh, basically the idea is you sort of knight them as security SMEs or security subject matter experts, um, and then you actually make them responsible for participating in certain process flows around the controls that you've structured. Uh, and at least that's the, that's the way that, uh, that we've done it in many organizations, and it seems to work fairly well, right? Uh, not only do you have uh, extra people, right? You can, you can tap some of the dev folks, uh, it's generally a, just a small tax on their time, which of course you have to get some permission or buy-in from the dev org to tax anybody's time there. But, um, but at the end of the day, it really tends to be pretty useful, right? Because they already have knowledge of the development uh, organization about the pieces of software specifically that are under development, uh, and they can really be pretty effective resources in that context. Okay, the uh, next one is uh, just a real quick one about, about measurement, right? So, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of metrics and things like that that we put in the SAM model, but the one really high-level piece that I wanted to make mention of that we've sort of figured out is that you actually need a couple of different kinds of metrics, right? So there's this notion of if you're starting off and you don't really have a lot of activities for security incorporated into your processes, uh, the first thing you have to do really is establish the metrics around ramping up those controls, 